You know one of those really long books in the Bible that you've never really read? Let's go there. Or, how a short Jesus story helps you understand the book of Job. Welcome to another installment in the Over My Shoulder Bible Study series. These brief video Bible studies typically serve to supplement the sermon that I preach each Sunday here with the Missouri Street Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. Right now, the vast majority of my sermons are geared to go in conjunction with our three-year church-wide Bible reading project. We call that project Immerse. And right now, the last three weeks of April, we find ourselves submerged in the book of Job, reading it from beginning to end, all 42 chapters. The book of Job is complicated, and for that very reason, I suspect that's why very few people I've ever encountered in life have actually read it, at least from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 42. In my experience, most people, Christians or otherwise, have only read the first couple of chapters and maybe the last chapter, and that's about it. Maybe heard a little bit from chapter 19, yanked terribly out of context, in a sermon or a lesson or more often a funeral setting. But that's fodder for another OMS another time. Back to the book of Job and what it's about. The book of Job really turns on a concept that can be said in two words, but don't let them scare you off. Uh, the two words, retribution theory. You know what that is, whether you've ever heard that phraseology or not. It's one of the most common forms of thinking that's out there in the world. The only problem is, is it's only half true. Retribution theory basically says good people get good things their way. Uh, good things happen to good people. And People who do wicked things, bad things, bad things are going to happen to them. Righteous people miss out on pain. They prosper. Evil people, they'll pay for their sins. They suffer. Some truth to that, but only half true. We all know plenty of people who seem by every measure extremely good people, but seem to have a very difficult life all the step of the way, maybe all of their days. And we also know of people who are evil to the core. They do many wicked things, and they seem to always get away with it. In fact, they even prosper. And we say, what's up with that? Glad you asked. Do you remember that story in John's Gospel, one of the best-known books in the Bible, John chapter 9 to be precise, where Jesus comes across a man who is blind and has been blind from birth? His disciples see the same man, and they turn him into a theology question. That's the best they can do. Rabbi, who sinned? Did this man sin, and that's why he's blind? Or was it his parents who sinned, and that made him blind? Most of us probably, in seeing this and hearing this question, naturally are revolted by it. We just say, that's just messed up. That's just altogether wrong. This guy, how is it that his sin made him blind? Well, that's retribution theory, isn't it? Uh, the disciples see this man blind. He's suffering. And so, by definition of retribution theory, he must have sinned. Or a modified version of it, his parents sinned. Jesus says, man, you're messed up. You've really got it wrong. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Well, why did it happen? Listen to what Jesus says. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. There's mystery as well as explanation attached to this explanation, isn't there? Hmm. We are in such deep water that it's not possible for the Son of God himself to reveal it completely in words that you and I can put our head around. Faith is required, and that's what the rest of the chapter is about, namely the blind men blind man having great faith and his disciples uh, coming to some persuasion as a result. Keep this construct in mind, retribution theory, and what you naturally thought about it. Well, it's a little messed up. Jesus knows better, too, right? Well, that's the construct behind the entirety of the book of Job. The first two chapters of the book basically are a narrative format that give us the construct that the rest of the program, the book of Job, loads on to. And that is that there was this very good man who lost everything, including his health. He lost virtually everything except his life. And now he has to deal with that. Chapter 3 gives us an insight into what's going on into Job's mind and heart about these matters of these losses. 
And then chapter 4 through 27 deals with some friends who had originally shown up and been silent for a solid week as they sympathized and empathized with Job's plight. They were doing great grief ministry till they opened their mouth. Sometimes just presence and silence is powerful. However, they turned their power into great weakness. These three friends are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And chapters 4 through 27 basically are a series of cycles of a conversation or a dialogue between these three friends and Job. Eliphaz will have his say, and then Job will respond to what Eliphaz has said. And then the same thing happens with Bildad. Job will respond, and then again with Zophar, and Job will respond. This goes on, as we said, for till chapter 27. And the essence of all three friends' positions is that, Job, the reason you're suffering is because you've sinned. Now, maybe it was sins in your past, uh, that you haven't acknowledged or even was aware of, or maybe it's um, something of your motives, but we're not going to go there. It's probably something in your past or your present, in your actions that you're either not owning up to or you don't realize. So you need to repent, and then you will prosper. Job, in all of his responses, basically says, Boy, you guys just don't get it, do you? <laughs> I was righteous before I was suffering, and I've been righteous in my suffering, and you're just wrong. You're not, you're not helping me any here. And his final word to his friends here in chapter 27 really underscores just how he believes he's perfectly righteous. Now, at this moment, we get one chapter of something of an interlude is the subtitle in the NIV puts it, a time to reflect on why this writing is in here for us. This whole story exists not to explain why suffering comes about, what we'd all like to know the complete answer to, but where does wisdom come from? Namely, how do we handle suffering and deal with God at the same time rightly? Hmm, a different question, isn't it? Now, in chapter 29, in 30 and 31, Job will give a lengthy and in-depth defense of himself. He'll say, in effect, as in summary to all three of his friends, and to triple underscore what he means is, look, I know what it was like before I started suffering, and I was a good guy. And I'm telling you, uh, that's been true all the way through my suffering in the present time, too. In chapter 31, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. How many different times and ways do I have to say it? I'm a righteous guy. These things that are happening to me are wrong. And I'm blaming God for that. Something's messed up with the system. Hmm, big words, big talk, isn't it? Well, a younger man, at least younger than the three friends Eliphaz built in so far, has been overhearing this. His name is Elihu. And now Elihu speaks up. Oh, no, does he speak up? Not only in terms of depth and strength of charge, but at length. 32 through 37, those chapters, Elihu speaks uninterrupted. And the essence of Elihu's thoughts are is that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, uh, they've missed it. Job, I agree with you. They are wrong. But I also disagree with you too, Job. You say you're righteous. Well, the problem is, is you left off a word. You're righteous, all right, but you're self-righteous. You see, what Elihu is saying is, is, Job, you've sinned, but it goes to your motives. Hmm. Now, Elihu, after he speaks at length here, finally he is silent, and the one that we've been waiting to hear speaks the Lord. The Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. <laughs> Indeed, it has been a storm. And in fact, the Lord says, I've been listening to all of you humans talk about this subject, and I just want you to know none of you have got it. At best, you're offering half-truths. This retribution theory thing that you're talking about, that doesn't fully answer it. And while, Elihu, I agree with much of what you say, I don't agree with everything you have to say in your diagnosis of Job's self-righteousness. Chapter 40 and 41 are somewhat well-known to those that have read some more of the book than just the opening two chapters and the last, because it's a list of dozens of illustrations of how that 
Well, God alone is God. We humans may get a little big for our britches and think we can explain everything. We have all knowledge and can answer all the questions of life. But God asks a lot of questions here that simply are unanswerable. God alone is God. Now, having heard God speak in the midst of the storm and having given humans their shot, a very lengthy shot, to give the best they can offer from multiple avenues of approach, Job dares to open his mouth to the Lord, just as he did to his friends. But his response here is remarkable. The bottom line, I despise myself and I repent. Job acknowledges that he was not as righteous as he claimed, perhaps not nearly as righteous as he thought he was. He's convicted. He repents in dust and ashes. Now, the rest of the story, just a few lines here, the narrator gives us is joy. Uh, now, Job, having repented, receives great blessing and favor from the Lord. But he had to go through a lot in order to get to here. And those losses he experienced before, it, it's not like his family came back to life, is it? No, he gets a new start, a new lease on life, because he's decided to turn the page and remember exactly what his proper posture before God is to be. His friends aren't God, and their answers aren't from God, whether it was the first three or Elihu later. The Lord alone is God. And when Job puts God on the pedestal where he belongs... Things go better for him, inside and out. May you and I embrace the whole truth of God. That is, that is, there are some things revealed for us, and there are other things that are secret and remain with the Lord. If you'd like some commentary on that, read Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. Grace and peace be with us all.